So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the HKS Energy Policy Seminar. I'm Joe Aldi. I'll serve as the host today. Uh, as usual, we're operating uh, in a hybrid format. So we have uh, friends and colleagues and students uh, joining us via Zoom. Uh, and thrilled to have the room full here uh, on campus at HKS. It's my pleasure to welcome Jim Stock for his talk, The Climate Implications of US LNG Facilities. Jim Stock is the Vice Provost for Climate and Sustainability at Harvard, Director of the Salada Institute for Climate and Sustainability at Harvard, and the Harold Hitchings Burbank Professor of Political Economy in the Department of Economics and at the Harvard Kennedy School. In these roles, Jim leads the development of a coordinated university-wide strategy to address climate change, bringing greater focus, clarity, and visibility to Harvard's breadth of work on climate and sustainability. Partnering with faculty, researchers, students, and staff around the university, Jim marshals and amplifies our efforts to bridge disciplines and tackle the cross-cutting challenges presented by climate change. His research areas cover a lot of major topics from empirical macroeconomics, monetary policy, econometric methods, and energy and environmental policy. Jim served as a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, where his portfolio included macroeconomics and energy and environmental policy. Jim, it's a pleasure to have you here in the Energy Policy Seminar. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Is this uh, is the audio work? Okay, terrific, good. Okay, so um, thanks, it's a pleasure to be here and um, I'm uh, really happy to uh, be able to uh, talk about this. So thanks for the invitation, Joe. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, uh, talk about natural, uh, natural gas exports through LNG facilities uh, I'm going to take just a, a minute before I get started on that. I just want to uh, show one slide. Uh, I don't know if uh, you were watching last week uh, or if you've paid attention to the release of the EIA's <clears throat> annual energy outlook, but I just want to pull up, put up one slide. So the EIA, just as a background for the students who aren't aware, the Energy Information Administration is the major entity for uh, energy projections in the United States. Uh, in the federal government and also for collecting data and promulgating data. And they have a ton of great data on their website. They uh, run <clears throat> models and do simulations. And every year they do a projection uh, and lots of different variations about how the US energy system is unfolding. And that is all embodied in what's called their annual energy outlook. They released their annual energy outlook uh, last week uh, Friday, I think, Thursday or Friday, I think. Uh, yeah, I, and, uh, and, there, and I just, I'm gonna put up one slide in case you haven't actually. Um, so for some people, you know, like me, you are watching the live feed and for other people it might be on your list and for other people you might not have heard of the EIA. Uh, so, uh, so I wanna put up just one slide. This is their slide of uh, US energy related carbon dioxide emissions projections. And so we're here in 2022. They, they locked everything down in November of last year. <clears throat> so it, this includes the Inflation Reduction Act. And this is their, the black line is their reference scenario. So their uh, bottom line is that they project CO2 emissions from energy to fall by between 25 to 38% relative to 2005 under current policies as of November, 2022, which includes the Inflation Reduction Act. And um, I think this is probably of interest to this group because you saw John Larson talk about the rhodium projections for the effect of the Inflation Reduction Act. And they had projected roughly about a 10 percentage point contribution to the decline as a result of the IRA by 2030, and it's a little bit less here. They have about a seven percentage point between the red line and the black line. But overall, this is a, you know, this is a fairly, at least to my eyes, a fairly sobering chart. If you think about how much conversation there is about, um, about climate change, about how much conversation there is about corporate responsibility and net zero targets, uh, ambition at the state level, passing the Inflation Reduction Act, and all of that gets thrown into the model. Now we could argue over the details of the model, and some people might think this is maybe too pessimistic or something. But they're pretty; they're very serious. They're very serious folks at the EIA, uh, and it's a, a, for me at least, a fairly sobering picture. So 
um, on that, with that, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, LNG exports. And uh, this is a topic, uh, I'll, I'll be fair, this is a topic that um, I've been interested in since I, oh, for, for 10 years, since I was at the White House. Uh, and we had to look through some projections and in, in, in programmatic in, in energy, a uh, programmatic uh, uh, environmental impact assessment for LNG exports. And I'll talk about that a little bit, but I, I will just say that as a preface that I'm sort of always, I've been interested in this for a long time. I haven't actually had the opportunity to do any research. And so I, we're doing, a, doing some work with Matt Zaragoza Watkins. And then there's a um, undergraduate who's writing her uh, undergraduate dissertation on this. Uh, and it's, so it's, this is a, a fun joint project. Okay, so, okay, so here's the, here's the deal. There's actually been a ton of really interesting conversations on supply side uh, climate policy over the last uh, two years. And this is just gonna be an example of that. There was an attempt early on in the administration to uh, undertake fossil fuel leasing reform, perhaps think about including uh, climate costs into royalties. And so the royalties would have a price mechanism to adjust for climate damages from burning the fossil fuels. That sort of got, you know, there's some interest in that. And then in, in, in the end, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a very modest increase in royalties. So that didn't really go anywhere, but it was a quite a, you know, a big conversation. Back in November, 2021, the Biden administration did the largest offshore leasing sale, which is a lease sale 257, uh, which had, I don't know, like $200 million worth of bids um, and a lot of uptake and a lot of interest. Uh, that was, uh, let's see, there was some court litigation about that. It was put on hold. And then in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, it was the court, the Congress decided to over, just to, to say that lease sale 257 could be implemented. Uh, recently, there was the, just last week, uh, Conical Phillips was awarded the Willow Project. Well, the permits, the most, the, the major permits were granted for that leasing, uh, for that leasing undertaking. Um, there's been a large amount of discussion, a really interesting and important discussion about natural gas permitting, permitting uh, pipeline permitting and siting in the context of NEPA reform. And, and much of that conversation is not just about natural gas pipelines, but about transmission. So it really cuts across both the fossil fuel and the renewable world. And it's a very important conversation. And then a piece of that is um, natural gas exports. So natural gas, uh, we'll talk about lots of the particulars in just a minute. Um, natural gas uh, is, is you don't just put it on a tanker and then ship it somewhere. You got it's a it's because it's a gas. You need to liquefy it, and there's it's a big undertaking to do the whole all of the engineering and to to get it out to and to, to export it. And actually, the Department of Energy has to approve that. Uh, so this is a, an area that uh, is of considerable interest, considerable policy interest. There's a recent uh, bill that's been proposed to uh, to expand natural gas exports, and I'll talk about that and briefly. Uh, the main thing uh, I'm gonna do, so I, I will say uh, after this programmatic review is a 2012 through 2014 programmatic review, um, there were some pipeline, there was, excuse me, uh, there was this programmatic review. And at that point then the Department of Energy issued uh, quite a few natural gas export permits. These, these, are, these are all permits for really large facilities. And what happened is a fracking had been happening, but a lot of that gas was locked in and only used domestically. But then as the natural gas facilities started coming online, there was an opportunity to export, to produce more and to export more. <clears throat> and you can see that uh, you can see that the orange is the export share of production and we're up to around, you know, all, about 20% of natural gas production today is actually exported through, a par partly through pipelines. Uh, these are all, this is all pipeline exports, but mainly the growth is all through natural, through liquefied natural gas facilities. 
I should mention just another piece of the history, and I'm going to go through this in more detail. As we did more frac natural gas, that went somewhere. We produced a lot more. And basically what it did is it drove out a fair amount of exports. And then eventually we got to this point. Uh, imports, thank you, thank you. For, drove out a fair amount of imports, thank you. Uh, and then we got to this point where the export terminals started coming online. And then this went up. Now you might wonder why we just didn't drive out more imports. And that has to do with complications of the pipelines and that, that there's a, that there's there's some places in the United States like here that still has to import uh, because we're not connected uh, by big enough pipelines to the rest of the country. Okay, um, all right. So uh, this is uh, so. Let me just a, a really brief comment on on the legal situation and how this works. If you want to export natural gas, suppose you have a few billion dollars burning a hole in your pocket, and you want to build an export terminal for natural gas then you're going to get permission. You have to ask permission to the Department of Energy. Now, if you're going to export to a free trade agreement country, Mexico, Canada being the main ones, uh, which you would do by pipeline or Australia and Singapore, you get automatic approval. So you are required to apply. They are required to approve. But if you're going to a non-FTA country, so read Europe and Japan, so actually the major partners here, uh, then uh, then you need to actually go through an official, they have to go through a process that says that you get, uh, uh, you would, you, it would be in the public interest for you to do that. And then they've currently been, uh, the Department of Energy has currently been granting those, and that was the basis of their review back in 2014. Uh, the Cruise Bill would automatically grant for non-FTA countries, as long as you're not in a trade war, uh, for non-FTA countries, they would uh, automatically grant approval. On the other hand, there's a lot of interest on the other side of the progressive, um, progressive environmental community for saying, well, we should just stop doing these exports. Uh, there's a variety of arguments along this, these lines. They have to do with, uh, you know, what are, how are we helping European partners at the moment? What's the role of natural gas as a transition fuel? And then there's a whole bunch of issues, you know, methane leaks, local environmental problems. Uh, are we locking in infrastructure? Uh, and is this something that's going to be helping decarbonize or is it going to be retarding decarbonization? So there's a ton of really interesting issues here in this area. Uh, and it's a, and it's particularly complicated because of the the because it's so much more difficult to export. I mean, physically hard. Uh, to export natural gas than it is uh, for um, for uh, for oil. So um, what am I going to do today? I'm going to talk uh, about. Uh, so if you were looking for some like uh, really great, uh, deep and compelling policy conclusion on this, um, you're not going to get it today. I will have perhaps a few opinions. But this is um, an area that my experience is that very few people actually know much at all about natural gas. I mean, natural gas has been boring for so long uh, that like, you know, we all know like tons about power and tons about oil and a lot about solar and wind and batteries, but don't know very much about natural gas. So the main argument is that natural gas is no longer boring. It's actually incredibly important. And these liquefied natural gas export facilities are likely to have really important consequences, some of which we can probably predict, some of which are really hard to predict, uh, but we can sort of point, point to them. So it's a very interesting area. And mainly I'm gonna do, this is like natural gas 101 and like what's been going on in these markets. And then they'll have some pretty important implications for the energy transition. Uh, and I'll talk about those, uh, those going forward. And this conversation is mainly is focused on, especially the energy transition part is focused on the US and the absence of the international component of that is, is glaring. And so I'll just stress, but for one of you point that out, I'll point that out. Okay, so, uh, so, um, okay, so, uh, so here's a summary of what, uh, of, the, of, the main, of the story. So the summary of the story is uh, that there's going to be. I'm going to focus on uh, focus on three episodes. And this is a plot of Brent and Henry Hub, 
and uh, uh, I'm sorry, Henry Hub. What's Henry Hub? Henry Hub is the main. So we think of WTI or uh, West Texas Intermediate as being a benchmark oil price for the United States. And then Brent is a benchmark oil price for Europe. And because you can transport oil by ship, it's almost always the same uh, or very close to each other. They're similar grades. Henry Hub is the main benchmark price for natural gas in the United States. And it's down in Louisiana. And, uh, and so the units are dollars per MMBTU. Uh, and uh, and that's, so that's, that's, that's the main, this is the wholesale price wholesale spot price for um, at, 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 this, at this main pricing hub in Louisiana. Okay, um, and so there's, I'm gonna, here's the main story. The main story is that, uh, uh, is that there are three regime, there have been three regimes, roughly speaking, in the United States. And one of them is a pre-fracking regime. And in that case, uh, oil prices and natural gas prices tracked each other very closely. And they did so because oil and natural gas were actually substitutes in production of electricity. So steam boilers were run some of the time by oil and some of the time by natural gas, and you could adjust those margins. And that's the sort of there's this sort of there's this arbitrage going on. And it was there's a little bit of exports to Mexico and to Canada, but it's an, it's not a, you know, not connected to the rest of the world. Because we weren't connected to the rest of the world except for Canada and Mexico, when fracking started, when frack gas started being a deal, the the price that that connection between oil and natural gas uh, completely changed. The price of natural gas became very low. Uh, in the you know less than five dollars per MMBTU, in many cases two or three dollars per MMBTU, that meant that that and and there's you know new construction of natural gas combined cycle turbines, and at the same time there was essentially a cessation of using um, oil for power generation, except um, like in diesel peakers and things like that. So that basically. Uh, no longer had that margin of substitution uh, and these two prices disconnected. What's happened, this is the beginning, or this is the opening of the very first LNG export terminal, Chenier uh, Sabine Pass, which was in May of 2016. And that's just one terminal, but more of them came online. And I'm gonna argue uh, statistically, uh, statistically and also based on um, institutional facts, but statistically, that we are in the process, if, if actually we are reconnecting to world uh, natural gas prices. Now here I've just shown it with respect to oil. It turns out that oil prices are very closely connected to natural gas prices in Europe. So, uh, so we are basically by reconnecting to world oil prices, we're reconnecting to natural gas prices uh, internationally. So that's gonna be a very different regime going forward uh, it's going to be a, I'm going to suggest that if we're reconnecting to world natural gas prices, I should mention there's always going to be a gap between us and Europe because uh, we produce it here, but then you've got to gasify it, transport it, and uh, liquefy it, transport it, and then gasify it. And that costs a bunch of money to do that. So we're always going to be below Europe, uh, but, but that we would still be co-moving with Europe. I mean, and, and right now, Ukraine, thing, everything is crazy in the European markets, but sort of looking beyond, looking beyond uh, the current disruptions, uh, we would expect, I, I would expect that to be too true based on historical prices that would suggest natural gas prices here that are in the $6 to $8 range, which is, you know, in a way, it's sort of the range of prices that we had back in uh, 20, uh, not, these, are, these are nominal it's the range of nominal prices that we had uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and that's gonna suggest, I think that's gonna suggest <clears throat> have really substantial implications for, uh, for the energy transition in the United States and, and mainly, through, uh, mainly through the higher, higher prices. You know, the a back of the envelope is that this is the, the gap between many projections. Like I started out with the AEO. AEO projects ga uh, natural gas prices to be around three dollars per MMBTU, Henry Hub, uh, by the end of this decade. Uh, if you add a couple of dollars to that, 
uh, that's roughly the same as adding a 40 or $50 carbon tax. So it's kind of like by opening, so the ba one bottom line that by opening these LNG facilities, it's kind of like putting a 40 or $50 carbon tax on natural gas, which would have big effects. In the US, in the US, in the US, in the US. So I'm, yes, all, this is all very US centric. Yeah, so that's an interesting question, but there is very much a coal gas arbitrage, right? Because the, because the gas, coal is increasingly used for cycling. So what we've been seeing over the last year is coal prices have been going up as natural gas prices have been going up because of this coal gas arbitrage. We've been using more coal. So we're going to shift into coal, but then sort of what that in a longer term, right? There's going to be this shifting into coal, but it's coming at a very high price for coal and a high price for natural gas. So then that's, you know, going to expedite or provide yet another benefit, uh, monetary benefit for, um, for clean, uh, clean generation. Yeah. Yeah. On U.S. gas. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Where and globally, world prices have always been a lot higher. We are basically, except for Canada and the United and Mexico, we are basically disconnected from the world, like through here. We are connected to oil because we were just, we had expensive gas. I mean, it was all this onshore stuff and declining fields offshore and so forth. Uh, and it was co-firing. And then there's like a huge amount of gas that just jumped into the market and it depressed prices. And, and so I think a lot of us think, oh, well, we got low prices forever. We're always gonna have low prices. EIA projects out $3 uh, MMBTU, but I don't think that's right. No, 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 this is, this is no, no carbon tax, no border adjustments or anything. Yeah. Yes, except we have really substantial export capacity restrictions for coal. So the export terminals, there is an attempt to build a, a number of export terminals in Canada up in the Pacific Northwest so that they could export from the Powder River Basin over into the Australian or to the, to the South Asian and East Asian markets where the where Powder River Basin coal is like $12 per ton and it's selling for a hundred something dollars per ton if you can get it to you know, East Asia, but you have to go through an export terminal Turns out that Seattle wasn't super enthusiastic about having coal export terminals built there. And that just hasn't happened. There are a few export terminals on the East Coast, but they're pretty much near capacity. So there's just, and no one's talking about building more coal export terminals at this point. There was a conversation about that five years ago, but I, I, don't, I don't see how that's gonna happen. Um, okay, so here's, um, okay, so what are the units, an MMBTU, how, what's the energy content? So the energy content of, an M of one MMBTU is like a sixth of a barrel of oil. So just, I don't know, you can keep that number in your head, 0.176. Um, there's all these weird units that one might not be used to, which is they also come in thousands of cubic feet, which turns out to be just about, but not quite an MMBTU, which is a little slightly annoying. There's this thing called millions of tons per annum, uh, which turns out to be 0.13 BCF billion cubic feet per day, which turns out to be 0.133 times divided by 1.037 mm BTU per day, uh, whatever. So there's all these weird units uh, that we're not used to thinking of. You don't have to look at the axis units on this one because this one gives uh, this gives consumption and production, and production 
is, is, is this red line. Consumption is super seasonal, but you know, natural gas is one of the big uses for natural gas is home heating. So it's not surprising that it's heavily seasonal. Uh, if you smooth it out, you can see that for a long time we are importing natural gas. Uh, and then around 2016, uh, we started to become a net exporter and now we're a net exporter of natural gas. Um, okay, uh, a $40 a ton carbon tax is worth $2 per MMBTU. So if we think about Henry Hub as being around three or four dollars per mm BTU, a forty dollar carbon tax would be a you know 50, 60 percent fifty percent increase in the price. So it's a it's a big piece of change. Okay, so we get natural gas by pipelines in the United States. Pipelines go all over the place. There's um, you know most of the production of natural gas is what well, we don't. There's this stuff in the Gulf. Okay, so we have pipelines going out to the Gulf. It's in West Texas, it's in Oklahoma. There's some uh, other fields, uh, like the Bakken is mainly an oil field. So there's not a lot of uh, stuff up there. Uh, there's Pennsylvania uh, and those are the, the main production regions. And that's where you get the clusters that are bringing them together. Uh, we have a number of export terminals. Most of those export terminals are down in the Gulf, which makes sense because they get access to all this stuff from Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, this is uh, a picture of one of the export terminals, which is the Chenier Sabine Pass train one. So this is the first of the new export terminals that was actually, uh, it was actually designed to be an import terminal because back, back here, when they started building it, they said, well, we need to have more imports. But, but then, then they went bankrupt because that wasn't going to, you know, be a, there wasn't going to be a market for needing any imports. And then the facility was sitting there half built and it was purpose, repurposed as an export terminal. So it was the first out of the block uh, in, after getting these new uh, DOE approvals. Uh, natural gas tanker. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of ones that are uh, under a proposal. And I, I'm sure you can't read these, but some of these are, are quite large. You know, these are at three or eight or 10 BCF per day. Uh, let me see what the units are. Oh, this is BCF per month, terrific. Okay, so this is like 2000 BCF per month. So if we can divide that by 30, we get something like 60 BCF per day or something like that. So 60 BCF per day is in the you know, order of magnitude, kind of what we use, or 80 BCF per day. So if you're talking about a single terminal having export capacity of 3.6 3 BCF per day, that's on the order of a couple of percent of entire production. So these, if you add those up, these are really big numbers in terms of potential future export capacity of natural gas. <clears throat> Um, okay, so there's also this new technology. So this is, this is the older technology, which you spend multiple billions of dollars producing this gas liquefaction facility, putting it on tankers and, and then exporting it, uh, either for, you can send it to any free trade agreement country, but, um, but, but, but we have pipelines to Canada and Mexico. So like, there's no point in gasification really. So it, but really, so this is for non-free trade agreement countries mainly. So that's like Europe and Japan. Um, uh, there's this new technology, which uh, for a lot less money uh, and much, much more quickly, you can build these smaller facilities. And these are sometimes referred to as fast gas or fast LNG. Uh, and you can, you can, so what you do is you take a couple of old jack-up rigs or they can be floating rigs also uh, that are like sitting around and not being used of which there's apparently a fair number of them like 160 spare jackup rigs that are used for oil drilling that are just unused. Uh, and then you connect them together and you put on your liquefaction facilities and you put them offshore. And that can be done in 18 months. Uh, it's um, a little bit more expensive you know, per unit than the onshore facilities. But, you know, once you take into account the fact that you can do it in 18 months, uh, it starts to look pretty, uh, pretty appealing. And the margins right now for European export have been so high that the payback period for one of these is like um, under a year. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very, you know, a, a very interesting, you can see the scale of it with the LNG tanker in the background. Once it gets to Europe, it goes to an FSG, 
FSRU, which is a floating storage and regasification unit. So instead of having to build a great big thing in Europe, which you know might not, which is very controversial, you can just drive over one of these FSRUs and then connect it to the European system. And then, uh, and so that's this is sort of an, an, the new technology, uh, which is really interesting, and and it has big implications too because it can be done so quickly and so and can be so responsive. If Europe's situation is fine and you need to have the FSRU in Japan, you can just sail it to Japan. Um, uh, it's not interesting. Okay, so here's some key events, uh, some key events. Uh, so I mentioned how back in, roughly speaking, the late 2000s, uh, we stopped using co-firing <clears throat> of, of gas and oil, uh, which would have been residual fuel oil for uh, natural gas for um, steam boilers. And this is just um, electricity generated by petroleum. Uh, and you can see that it, you know, it sort of steps down around 2006 and steps down again around 2007. And then by 2010, essentially we're only using it for, you know, weather emergencies. And then there's just some background, background production. So we're no longer really having that as a margin in, uh, margin in production. This is um, natural gas withdrawals from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania where we had the first, uh, first fracking wells. And this started in 2010, or the first large scale fracking wells. And you can see how that sort of take, took off. So that's another important benchmark. And then another important benchmark is May of 2016. This is says 2015, but I think it's May of 2016, I think, uh, I think. Uh, when Sabine Pass actually started uh, producing. So they were permitted back in 2012, but then you know it takes a, quite a while to actually get one of these things fully fully up on, on, on scale. I showed you these pictures. These are these three different periods uh, episodes. So episode one is when we had this pair, we had um, we were using, uh, using it for co-firing. This is sort of the phasing out of that. This is the fracking disconnected period. And then this is the LNG period. Um, okay, so uh, this is then what prices look like in this period, these different periods. So this is not, you know, it's, it makes sense. And it was just sort of a generally accepted, if you go back and you read the old industry analyst type stuff, it's just, this is how it worked. And there is this rule of thumb where you multiply by one sixth because of that ratio 1.176. Uh, and there's a rule of thumb in terms of pricing. And I'm gonna give you a slightly refined rule of thumb on that, but it works very well. That was starting to break down during this period. It completely broke down during fracking. And then, then the whole question mark is whether we're actually doing this reconnection. Okay. Um, let me say a few things about prices. I'll, I'll try not to spend too much time. One of the interesting things about natural gas is because we've got all of these pipeline restrictions, you see some really weird stuff in prices uh, and capacity constraints. Some of that just occurs, you know, if you're, I don't know, when was the, when was the Texas freeze? In, so, you know, these are all like different freezes. And so then there's big capacity constraints and then the Henry Hub price jumps up. Uh, this, this, must have been the, this must have been the Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the big Texas freeze. Um, but you can see that, that that was the biggest, but it happens. It's historically always been the case. Um, just as a data thing. So sort of the, you know, this is, these are super annoying for time series work. So you just get rid of that, uh, you just get rid of it. Um, the, oh, this is Henry Hub. Okay, so it's in Arath, Louisiana. So it's actually a place. Um, and so I'm gonna show you data from, we have data from uh, a, a number of different sources, but we have it up to 89 different trading hubs. So these are all trading hubs. Henry Hub is the big one. So Henry Hub is down here and here it is. So Henry Hub is the big one, but uh, and the main one that's priced. But there's a lot of other important trading hubs. I'm just going to show you prices from a few of them. 
One of them is the Dawn Ontario hub, and that's important because that feeds most of Canada. So you go into, you cross the border, there's uh, gonna, I'll show you a pipeline, you cross the border, and then it feeds up here. Another one is Dominion, which is partially connected to Dawn Ontario. You'd think it should be really closely connected, but there's some glitches. This is mainly a production hub. So it's collecting the Pennsylvania gas. Um, there's the Algonquin hub, uh, Algonquin Gates trading hub. That's the one here in Boston. And that actually is an LNG import facility as well as a pipeline uh, pipeline input. And then there's this AECO storage hub, which is the main collection hub and storage units for all of the stuff that's produced up in Alberta. So I'm gonna show you those different prices. So, and, and here's the, so this is, Alberta has some connections to the United States, uh, but mainly the Alberta stuff flows east and then flows west, all right? The, there's the, you can see there's a couple of pipelines that go right up into the Don Ontario region, uh, right through here. And, and then we've got some connections to Dominion. And then what's really noticeable is that when you start to get up into, up into Massachusetts, like there's like a pipeline, there was gonna be, there was proposed to be another pipeline in through here and that got scuttled. So there's real capacity constraints. So we actually have and still have LNG imports uh, through the through our trading hub, uh, through the Algonquin hub. And we burn oil. It's, yep, absolutely. And we burn oil. <clears throat> uh, okay, so this is, this is just prices. So I've gotten rid of all of the, I, no, I actually on this one, I haven't gotten rid of it. It's just, I'm picking a period of time when we didn't have any of the big spikes. So we can look at it. So this is just, you know, this is Henry Hub prices last year uh, between four and ten dollars, and a lot of this volatility reflects um, reflects Ukraine. Uh, and so, okay, so what are we looking at? This is Dawn Ontario. So it's not so Dawn Ontario. Remember, is connected to Henry Hub. So unless there's some weird thing like a pipeline breaking down or you know Texas freeze or something, you'd expect that there. You know, th sometimes there's opening of gaps between Don Ontario and Henry Hub, but by and large, and something weird happening here, but by and large, these things track each other reasonably well. Uh, this is if you add in the Dominion. So the Dominion is that collection hub for um, Pennsylvania fracking, and it's pretty close by, and it's fairly similar, although there seems to be always a price decrement for the Dominion hub, and I don't know why that is. Um, this is if you add in AECO storage. So AECO storage is largely not connected to the rest of this system. There's some connections, but mainly it serves Canada and it mainly goes out West and then back to Eastern Canada too. And there's this, so sometimes it's connected, but then some weird stuff happens. Like there was a, a lot of excess, there was a lot of production in August and September in Alberta and they ran out of storage. And this is the day ahead. This is the day ahead price. The spot price actually went negative. So we had negative spot prices in the AECO collection uh, collection hub uh, because they just couldn't. They they wanted you to. They wanted to pay you to get rid of the stuff that they couldn't store. Uh, so um, so that's and now it seems to have you know reconnected here. So weird stuff happens. Uh, this is Boston. Uh, and so Boston, most of the time, is connected to the rest of the country by pipelines. But then basically, now and then, uh, we hit our pipeline constraints and we have to pay world prices for LNG export imports. And if you look at this on a, uh, a historical basis, Boston is yellow and uh, uh, Algonquin, Algonquin Gates. Uh, is yellow. And basically you say, well, why is it happening so regularly? Why does it seem to happen every 12 months? Uh, and so every 12 months, we're paying a lot for our gas here in Boston. And, you know, that's, you know, you, you've probably heard stories on the radio about electricity prices going up, or maybe you've even noticed that in your bill or something like that. And that's all because of because we're not, we're paying on the international, international market. And international gas prices are really high right now. This ends in this ends at the in in December, okay. Uh, what you might say, why don't we get LNG exports from the Gulf? Who knows the answer to that? We know we could at least try to get LNG exports from the Gulf, but we can't because of the Jones Act. The Jones Act says that any boat, any ship going from one U.S. port to another U.S. port has to be U.S. flagged. How many LNG tankers do we have that are U.S. flagged? Big zero. 
So we actually buy from Qatar uh, as they're exporting from Shreveport. Um, okay. Uh, these are a bunch of, of prices in Europe. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the details. Uh, the older price hub that was mainly used for Europe is the national balancing point in the UK. The more modern one is in the Netherlands, which is, the, which is a virtual trading. TTF stands for something, but it's a virtual trading hub for uh, pricing in the Netherlands. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so this is just, this is just more, uh, more pricing in the Netherlands and, and in Europe. Okay, this is an important picture. So what we have here is we have the EU composite price, which is pretty much like the TTF price, which is this virtual trading hub in the Netherlands. And this one takes in Le Havre and the national balancing point and so forth and Brent. And you'll notice that this is, in, and I've cut it off here right before the Ukraine stuff where, where then this constraints. And you'll notice that it really co-varies very, very strongly with Brent. So that's, and that's really an important feature that European oil uh, and European natural gas co-move together. So this is actually a key part of the whole story and why I'm gonna be focusing on relations with oil prices. All right, so I'm gonna skim through the results fairly quickly. Uh, and um, basically the empirical question is, does that story make any sense? So I made this story up well, I didn't completely make it up, but I made up this story about it being connected and then disconnected and reconnected. And can we see any statistical evidence for that? And these, you know, we, you know, there's a lot of evidence that oil prices fall, have a unit root, and these prices for gas also follow unit roots. And it kind of makes sense theoretically. And it certainly is true empirically. So then green connected and disconnected is like, are these two unit root processes or random walk type processes moving together? And that's kind of an old thing that some of you might have heard of called co-integration. So we'll be looking at these statistics for what those relationships are and whether these series are so-called co-integrated or not. So this is probably a little heavier lifting than we usually do in this group, but um, that's where it goes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Welcome back from spring break, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so here's just the summary. So I've used, I'm right, so far I've been using um, uh, institutional breakpoints. So I said that we had this period where there was co-firing of gas and oil uh, in steam boilers, residual fuel oil. Uh, and then there was this period that's kind of like breaking down, but still kind of used. And then finally, all of that residual fuel, uh, all of the fuel oil, we just, excuse me, all the, we just stopped using residual fuel oil for steam boilers, except in a few very special cases. Uh, and um, and then, uh, then there's this period of fracking uh, and then there's this period of potential reconnection. So those are the four episodes. This is the uh, first one. So this is a test, is it co-integrated? And the answer is yes, at the 5% significance level. So, uh, so that's, uh, so that's um, uh, and then what's the coefficient? This is like the coolest regression. Remember divide, what was that number one sixth? So 0.176 MMBTU equivalent. It's like, whoa, man. And it's like, this is within one standard error of MMBTU, of, of BTU equivalents of energy value parity. So this is like incredibly cool. Uh, and okay, so then what about, what about this period here? Well, it looks, this is where it's kind of breaking down, but you get some relationship and that coefficient has dropped to about 0.07. The formal test says that it's probably not co-integrated. So it's kind of mushy here. Uh, this is this period where um, it's all fracking. And so the formal test says it's not co-integrated. The coefficient happens to be zero anyway. Uh, and you can just see these, these plots. It's just like, there's no relationship between the oil price and the gas price. And then this is this final episode. So I was starting in May of 2016. Uh, I, believe, I, I believe that this is the date of the first, actually, yeah, I think this is the date of the first 
Is, well, May of 2016 is when they started the uh, exports from Chenier, Sabine Pass 1. Uh, I mean, those were small amounts of exports and it's grown a lot since then. And so what you do is you find it's co-integrated at the 5% level. Now, the thing that's interesting, <clears throat> and I don't have an answer to this, this is like one of the loose ends, which is this coefficient is 0.07. You would not expect the coefficient to be one sixth or 0.167 because we're not on that margin anymore. We don't, we don't have that margin of residual fuel oil versus, um, versus uh, natural gas. Uh, but in Europe, there is this margin of, um, of oil and natural gas. And then how is that driving a coefficient of 0 0.07? And I don't know the answer to that. One sort of thought, but this isn't really right, is if you, um, is if you take into account the fact that we're using NGCC, so in Europe they still fire, they still use petroleum for uh, for um, for uh, electricity production, but um, not but they don't do co-firing of natural gas. Instead, the natural gas is done through natural gas combined cycle, and that's a lot more efficient than just shooting it into a boiler and boiling water. And that coefficient is down. If you then make those necessary adjustments that coefficient is not 0.161, but 0.11. So 0.11 kind of sounds a little better than closer to 0.07, but it still isn't 0.07. So I still don't quite have uh, the answer as to why we have this relationship. This is just the rolling regression plot. And you can see we had this period here. This is what's called the, in the jargon, it's called burner tip parity, which is that you can shoot in either the residual fuel oil or the natural gas. Uh, there was this period where there is no relationship and we now seem to be in this new one. This is the NGCC steam parity, but we're still a 0.11, but we're still a chunk below that. So that's a bit of a mystery. Um, these are just like different ways to say it. Oh, I will, you know, I'm not gonna go. So these are the, we did, and this is how well does it fit during institutional breaks. So I take the fitted values and you can see there's like no relationship here. So the fitted values look really lousy during this period, but then the fitted values start to look quite good here. Okay, um, you can do the same thing with estimated break dates. And then you can be, a, if you're sort of a graduate student who does time series, then you'd say, why don't we estimate the break dates? And then, so you can do that too. Okay, so we'll skip that. Okay, so the final thing is like the so what's. So I don't know, you know, I don't know, Turns out, I don't know what oil prices are going to be in five years. And it turns out, I don't know what gas prices are going to be in five years. Um, I think there's a strong reason to think that our oil, our gas prices are going to be higher than we might have thought had we not recognized this reconnection to uh, international uh, markets. So here's some, here's some crude calculations these are these are like placeholder calculations, and I'll tell you what we're going to do. That's maybe a little bit better than this in just a minute. Uh, but what what here's what we've done. So we've done a, a done a series of calculations using some runs from the uh, from the Reeds model, which is a model of the power sector in the United States at different natural gas prices. And this does not take into account the coal price connection. So this is this has got limits. Um, and one of them is just supposing that we have three dollar and ten cent uh, gas uh, with um, uh, with with this is BAU. I'm sorry, that means pre IRA, and then this is with the IRA. And we found that um, the emissions reduction as a result of the IRA was to fall to 60, 62 percent relative to forty six percent, which is a fifteen percentage point drop, which is consistent with a lot of the other estimates, and that's pretty consistent with the. Uh, with the uh, estimate that uh, AE, that the that EIA just put out last week on Friday for the AEO, so this is like an IRA effect. If instead you said, "What if we got those two dollars?" So this is like in effect, what if we had just put on a forty dollar carbon tax on uh, on natural gas? Well, uh, it would have. What would what would emissions in two thousand thirty relative to the peak be? They'd be down to. Uh, they'd be. Um, they'd be a. a 57, uh, they'd be 57%. So not quite at the 62%, uh, six, um, no, they, I'm sorry, getting us, uh, let me, 2030 emissions relative, yes, these are reductions, excuse me. 
BAU is a reduction of 46%. IRA is a reduction of 62%. LNG only is a reduction of 57% or 11 percentage points. So the point of this calculation is suppose that we didn't have the IRA, but we all we did is we just continued to permit LNG. It's about the same size as the IRA. Now, the interactions are pretty complicated. And, and so, you know, what if you did both of these things? Well, if you did both these things, this kind of amps up the IRA by another, you know, another 10 percentage points. And then what if it really increases natural gas prices by a lot, then you're amping it up by about 30 percentage points. And it's interesting, what seems to happen here is that, it, is that it's driving, it's not really driving down how far you can decarbonize, because how far you can decarbonize is really gonna depend on a variety of other factors. Uh, but if what it seems to do is it seems to eliminate all of the, the cases that would have had little decarbonization in the power sector. Everything gets driven, give, driven down because you're basically slapping on a $40 carbon tax. So that's the uh, that's sort of where we are now. I, I think this is super preliminary. Um, I, one of the things we're going to do. There's a whole bunch of really good side cases, really interesting side cases, in the um, in the in the AEO that just came out. And I think what we're planning to do is instead of like running NEMS or having EIA do EIA do runs for us, which they would never do. Um, we can take their runs and we can essentially do a response surface summary of how the power sector works in NEMS uh, with respect to natural gas prices. And that's going to build in some coal price equi equilibration. So we can, I think we're going to try to redo these using response surfaces from the AEO 2023 uh, release. And I think that these are basically response surfaces from some stuff that we had done ourselves. Uh, but I, but I, I think we could probably profitably just pull off of the uh, EIA instead. So that is basically, uh, that's basically, um, that's basically where we are. So, um, yeah. Hey, Jeff. Let me, uh, we've got time, about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, let me start with a comment and then we'll take questions from the room. Uh, your statistical analysis where you're able to sort of replicate the energy ratio in the first period and you're not quite getting it in the final period I think in the final period, you're looking at two US prices, but the, uh, the action where we ought to be seeing some kind of equivalence is at the destination in Europe. Yeah. And I think because yeah. the differences in transport costs for gas and oil, that that ought to be creating some wedge. Uh, I don't know now because of the cost of gas liquefaction and then gasification, what that difference is. I still think it's cheaper to move oil than like oh, it's a lot cheaper gas. to move oil than so I think. Gas. I think that ought to be driving some of that <clears throat> yeah. wedge uh, that you see there. Yeah, and you know what's really a pity is that we can't just use um, uh, European prices on the right hand side because that is such a capacity constrained system, and those local prices have just gone crazy over the last year. So we just can't. We have to use this essentially this proxy, which is the oil prices. You, you know. Uh, the gas regasification, gasification, regasification is usually the number that people kick around is actually pretty big, like three or four dollars per MMBTU. Questions from the audience. So, uh, b back in the day when uh, this oil natural gas parity uh, conversation was prevalent and was going on all the time, uh, there was always sort of a net back story, which was uh, there's uh, you, you look for where is the uh, marginal uh, source of supply. Um, you calculate the long run cost of transport and gasification, and you get these equilibrium stories about the price in Europe uh, should be netted back to the United States. And the United States might be, we didn't think about it at the time, but um, now with fracking, uh, the marginal source of supply. Uh, and one of the things we know about gas from fracking is that the resource base is enormous. Uh, and so you could have very flat supply curves for a very uh, long time, which would justify expansion. And I'm wondering how all that fits into this, this story, because as you say, it's capacity constrained at the moment. So you get these 
crazy differentials between uh, Europe and the United States, but that's not sustainable. And uh, how is that going to affect what you're looking at here? So this is a great question. I mean, basically what you're asking is, so I'm, I'm presuming that US, that US gas prices are going to be rising to more of a world level. And that's without, and you're maybe to reinterpret to interpret what you're saying is that how can you say that without having a model of combined oil supply and demand globally and gas supply and demand globally, given that we have a really flat supply curve in the United States. So logically that's correct. Logically, you know, that the, you know, to be, to finish this story, we need to inter we need to augment it with international supply and demand curves. Uh, so there's another there's another co-author of mine, Brian Press to RFF, who's like the expert and owns the only such model that I think is, you know, really a good econometric model. So that would be a good a good project to do. Let me just say one word though about the really flat U.S. supply curve. I don't think it's actually really flat. I think that it is. Like, like all supply curves kind of upward sloping and that there's some fields that are you know more productive and cheaper to frack than other ones. So Permian Basin, West Texas is really you know the inexpensive one right now, but as gas prices have been going up, they've been opening up new plays. Uh, and those new plays are ones that are more expensive, but at whatever $8 Henry hub, they're able to, you know, they're able to be profitable. So I think that, you know, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't have that supply curve, but this is sort of just from listening or reading industry, you know, industry dialogues. So I, th I think there is a huge supply curve, but I don't think it's exactly flat. So I think that's the basic. Catherine? Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so a couple of questions. One um, is, uh, so the Permian is the second largest natural gas production area in the United States. And I think it's still the case that the majority of natural gas from Permian is a byproduct from oil production. So yeah. I wouldn't think that it would be another inherent production linkage beyond the substitution linkage that you were talking about. I was wondering if particularly because that is kicked up during that last period that you, like the dominance of that natural gas during the post 2016, where that's part of what's going on. And then the second question I had is Sabian Pass, we did the calculation, I think it's two, just com, so mainly the compression associated with natural gas um, uses a lot of energy and also therefore produces emissions. I think we calculated it was like something like 2.6 million tons per annum associate, at full capacity. Yeah associated with it. And so I was wondering, I mean, obviously that's going to be smaller than the end use on the LNG produced there, but how we should think about that in, in the context of your results. So that's a, that, that second point. So, so let's see, there's a two, was there a question on the Permian Basin part of it? Um, whether that's connected to the linkage oh, or the oh, change oh, oh, in the, the co-production. Co yeah. The, the co-production question. Yeah. So Yeah, so so I don't have I don't know. Uh, you know, co-production. If there's if there's co-production that's spurred by by oil prices, and then there's going to be additional gas. You know, that would be something that would be driving down gas prices domestically. I guess driving down gas prices globally if we're reconnected to global gas prices. So that would be just part of this desired model of international supply and demand. And the co-production is an important part of is an important part of that in the US. I mean, not in the US in fracking, you know, uh, for sure. So, I mean, point taken, uh, that just is additional modeling to do on, um, I'm sorry, the second one was, on, say, uh, oh yeah. So this is really a good point. I'm really glad you raised that. So this, oh, um, I have to be visible or something. Uh, th this, um, the the uh, co the, um, the 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 tran the transition fuel story for natural gas has a lot of question marks just to begin with about leakage and and you know uh, it built in you know long durability investment and so forth, but I th I think that it really is 
really diminished even further when you take into account all of the energy needs for, well, especially liquefaction, but then also the regasification. So, so I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and so if we're doing, trying to do a comprehensive analysis of all of the GHG uh, associated with this, then I think you'd want to have the power sector inputs impacts on the prices, but then there would be these additional GHG emission. Uh, it's that the, the, the emissions content of that gas is, uh, the CO2 content of that regasified gas is much higher. So I think that's a, that's a fair comment. Fortunately, we didn't try to quantify any of that. So um, that's an important comment. So two, two points. And the fact that Bill didn't make the first one makes me a little bit question whether it's the right point. But <laughs> um, I don't think 7 billion kilowatts. So I, I, I'd suspect that the burner tip parity isn't about the power sector, but it's about the industrial sector. Because I just don't think we were doing that much oil fired electricity generation. I don't think 7 billion kilowatt hours is very much. Okay. So that was um, way back here. So sorry, uh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So you think that that's just, billion, you think that's uh, yeah. not enough to yeah. actually drive this? Yeah, I don't, I don't, but Bill. Okay. <laughs> but, but it might So you think that's more industrial use or that something? That would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and the second point is we had an oil export ban until the end of 2015. So I worry that like the Brent WTI relationship changed right around. Yeah, yeah, also. yeah, 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 definitely. And then there was this Brent, there was this WTI lock-in period too, as we started doing more uh, fracked. So we couldn't, so yes, okay. that's completely, completely fair. So that was sort of during the 2014 period, there was this. Yeah. So, so you're suggesting, so let me see, most of my analysis is, is WTI. Is I know, I oh, think you had Brent. Well, I don't know, I probably, it if, depends if you on. Have WTI, this is, this is WTI and. I thought it was Brent. Oh, I don't know, it's like I do. There's this one period. Uh, so the Brent and the Europe would be the right one. So this is. Yeah, oh, this is WTI. is WTI. So that I'm using WTI. WTI. So okay, the, right, the, the co-integration okay. stuff is all okay. WTI. Okay. All right. I think yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I have a question regarding, um, well, we're seeing the story about uh, natural gas becoming more tradable. So uh, have you seen other um, initiatives to maybe make uh, renewables more tradable uh, and maybe how that will impact the relative price with respect to this increase in the price of, of natural gas and how that will impact the, how, do, how that will affect the impact uh, um, in, in emissions from, from, from the increase in this market, I mean? Uh, well, the, I mean, the, solar panels, there's a world market in that, except then there's all these export tariffs and all of that sort of stuff or import tariffs. But aside from the, the, from, from the whatever trade restrictions that we choose to put on, that's a completely global, completely global market. Uh, and I think the same is true for wind installations, that that's, a, you know, those are all uh, the, the material, the, you know, the turbines and the, that sort of thing are all priced on global markets, uh, there's local installation. So I think, and I, so I, I don't, I don't, I think all of the, I mean, then, then sort of there's the, you know, marginal costs. I mean, you can't, transporting, international transporting of the electricity is even more complicated than international transporting of natural gas, but at least for the raw materials, that's all the in, the manufactured inputs those are all highly highly globalized markets at this point i wanted to pick up uh both on on catherine and, and andrew's points first on on catherine's for the electricity co-firing that number of seven thousand uh terawatt hours whatever it was um that's not big enough so aside from not being <clears throat> big enough most of it's actually in hawaii 
Uh, and so if you go in the, the electricity sector, the, the share that's coming from petroleum, uh, for the longest time, the lion's share of it was, was actually in Hawaii. And it's a really tiny share in, in the electricity sector. The industrial sector is going to be a different story. And maybe there, there's something to that. But there's also just an element of, uh, of macro factors driving both of these that mm -hmm. is... Uh, as macro factors are, are driving up uh, oil prices or driving up gas prices for the same reason. Um, I would say to-, to I, I think this is the Hawaii part. The, this is back here in 2000s. Yeah. Where, so Hawaii is actually using a lot less now because they have all of the solar that's, that's absolutely taken off. But for, for the longest time, okay. uh, and I don't know if that's a Jones Act problem too, um, uh, or the, just the history of the military bases there that they've uh, been very oil intensive okay. in their grid. Um, the co-production uh, issue, I think, is an important one for the reason of that initial breaking of the co-integration, being that the oil prices were very high, high enough so that when you were producing, you could cover the cost of the well from selling the oil alone and yeah. driving the natural gas prices down to uneconomical yeah. levels that you'd never drill a well uh, yeah. just for gas. And, um, but I think it's really interesting to think about at what point do you get back to having so much that those marginal producers become marginal again uh, in terms of the decision between some indifference between oil and gas buyers or whatever product. Yeah, I was wondering, if you look at the economics of gas production, and you go back to around 2000, a lot of that was in, uh, I would one would make an investment, it would take seven or eight years to come completely on, and then uh, I would produce for the next 30, 40 years. With shale, I can do this very quickly, and I can shut it down very quickly. So if Bill is correct, and there is significant resource out there, I can go after that resource fairly fast. What I can't do, I couldn't do traditionally. What difference does that make in your model? Yeah, so, so the, but this is really huge. So this is, I mean, I think this is a great conversation. It's partly related to the co-production, but then it's partly related to, you know, other gas-directed fracking wells too. So, you know, if Bill is right, and in, if there really is, you know, once you build these export facilities, even if it's just a fast gas facility, then, and you're connected to the world markets, then you don't need to worry so much about US policy. And you've got this really big market and you can make these, you're willing to do the investment in the, in the fracking. And you know that, what that would mean is that, well, I'm wrong about oil price, gas prices going up to $8 and sitting there, that maybe what would happen is that we would end up just being the marginal producer and flood the international market and that gas prices in Europe might be $8 and they might be $4 here uh, or something like that. And that would have really different, really, diff really different implications. That would have really different climate implications if that's actually the case. So that's a really big, that would be a really, so getting the supply side right. So first of all, that would have the sort of the opposite effect. I mean, all of these price effects, my carbon tax story would simply be wrong. Uh, and then in Europe, you know, gosh, if they're just sitting there with the facilities that exist at $8 gas, I mean, they're motivated for a lot of other reasons, but it would sure take the economic pressure off. So that's a big question. Okay, well, um, I think we're good. So Jim, uh, before we wrap up, uh, we'll meet again next week, uh, Monday at 12 noon here uh, in the David Elwood Democracy Lab, uh, Ike Freiman of the Belfer Center will be here to speak about Chinese perspectives on climate geopolitics. And finally, please join me in thanking Jim Stock for his talk today. Thank you, Jim. Great.